It's Sunday morning, and we're in a study on the sovereignty of God. Sovereign means to be above and have power over all things. A sovereign in the ancient world was a king that gave the orders, and everyone had to obey those orders. We've been talking about predestination. I have been wondering, what is it that I have not told you about predestination? Because inevitably, people say, I get confused about that. I had a lady, I talked to a lady yesterday down outside of Austin, Texas, and we got to talking about predestination. She said, I get confused on this. What you have to do is wipe the slate clean in order to understand predestination. Get rid of all of your preconceived notions about what it's about. Now, we have used as our theme verse Romans 8 and 29. For whom he did foreknow. Oops, let me erase this up here. For whom he did foreknow. Now, it's very important that you understand the Bible says for. It's very important that you understand what whom is. Because because for is a it's a subordinate conjunction. Subordinate means you have to obey something that's above you or previous to you. For is in obedience to the previous verse. Romans eight and twenty eight. Romans eight twenty eight. And Romans eight twenty eight says and well that's very important that you understand that word and and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are thee called according to his purpose. But before you study that verse, you have to know that and is also a subordinate conjunction and that that's going to obey the previous verses. No verse stands alone by itself. For refers back to and we know that all things work together for good. Not to everybody in the world, only to those that love God. Only to those that love God, love, and those who are thee called. Now we keep saying this over and over about what love is. Love is, that word love is A-G-A-P-E-O. It is the verb form. Verb shows movement or action. Movement. Action. That's an action verb. Uh, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Well, in the Greek text, you have one word. You have two words. Agape and phileo. And you say, Jim, why do you keep putting this on the board? Because it's absolutely necessary to teach what I'm going to teach. Agape and phileo have been translated into love. And sometimes agape has been translated into charity. So you have to find out which word love is when you run across it in the Bible. The way you find out, you pick up your concordance. You look up the word love and every word in that text in the Bible will be listed alphabetically. Then you look at the number of the side of the word and, it'll, and you look it up in the Greek dictionary in the back of your concordance and it'll tell you if it's phileo or agape. Now phileo means to have affection for or be fond of. Affection, and you've got many words that are derivatives of phileo, philia. Philia, and you have the word philos, being fond of something. And the list goes on and on. Agape, this word right here, that's the word, them that love God. Well, you cannot love God unless he first loves you. There's none that seeks after God, therefore you can't love God. There's none that understands. If God does not, predestination is the only way to go to heaven. Because predestination is about a walk. It's about a walk. Now, the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those that agape, agapao. That word agape 
I keep saying we brought it out. It's a relationship. Relationship between fathers and sons or between kings and subjects. Now, I got most of this out of Kittle's New Testament Dictionary of Greek Words. That's a ten-volume set. You just look up the word agape, and there is 34 pages just on the word agape. So, agape is a relationship with fathers to sons, kings to subjects. That's why 2 John 6 says... There's Now, 2 John 6, the reason we, if you're not familiar with the Bible... There's only one, one chapter in Second John. That is the whole book. One chapter, and the sixth verse says, This is love. This is agape. When you look that up, that's agape. When you say this is something, you're giving a definition. This is love. Agape equals what that's saying, this is love, that we walk after His commandments. Now, so that's what agape is, walking in the commandments as a son of God, and being a son, that's what predestination is about. Remember we said over there in Ephesians 1 and verse 11 uh, that we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counts of his own will. Well, it is an inheritance. We inherit this as sons. And he says in verse 5 of, of Ephesians 1, he says, We have obtained in it, uh, excuse me, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. So predestination, having predestinated us, us unto adoption. Now adoption has an exact meaning. It is the word, it is a word that means to, it's the word U-I-O-T-H-E-S-I-A. Now there's a diacritical mark there, that is a breathing sound, who. Huyothosia. Huyothosia comes from huios and tithome. Now, tithome, Jim, what are you doing writing these strange words down for? The New Testament was written in Greek. We have the Greek text in this text or susceptus in the form of an interlinear Bible. Now, that's what we're teaching from. I teach from a King James Bible connected with the interlinear with the concordance, with the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. This word adoption, huiothosia, is a construction of huios, means sons, and tithome, meaning to place. If you are a son of God, he has to place you as a son, and he has to birth you by his will. You cannot be birthed by your will. No one here was ever birthed in the flesh or spiritually by their own will. That's not by the will of man. That's what John 1.13 says. We were born, speaking of the new birth, not of blood, nor it's not something you inherit from your mother and father, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If you believe God, God has to put belief. We're saved by grace through faith. Believe and faith are the basic same word. Faith is the word P-I-S-T-I-S. That's a noun. In the Greek, you'll invariably have a noun and a verb form of the noun. Faith. Well, faith cometh by hearing... And believe is the word P-I-S-T-E-U-O. If you'll notice, P-I-S-T is in both words, faith and believe. That's called the stem of the word. That's the part of the word that remains the same. The word endings are changed depending on some character of the word. 
This E-U-O causes this word pistis to become believe, and that's a verb. Faith is the noun. So believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith and believe are the basic same word. One is the thing, the other is the action of the thing. That's what it is. Now, we are saved by grace through faith, and we have to be placed as sons in faith. The Bible says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now, this word accounted, logizomai. Logizo means to assign. Now, an assignment is not something you assign to yourself. If you go to work, your boss assigns you some work, doesn't he? And do you have to do that? Well, you do, you lose your job. We are assigned faith, just like Abraham was. And it is a gift of God. It's not something you accept. It's something God places in your heart. And anyone that believes God, the belief has to come from God because keep remembering the Bible says there's none that seeks God. Nobody seeks God. All men at their best state is altogether vanity. That word means worthless. You don't have any good thing in you. The only good thing that's ever in a man is Christ in a man, but God did not predestinate everyone. I said a while ago, it, it really concerns me that I don't feel like I've really told you everything about predestination. I've been preaching on it for 25 years here. I keep looking at Romans 8 and 29, and I say, what is it that I'm not saying? And I was on the way to church this morning. I got to thinking. Let me see if I can clarify some of this up. For whom for refers back to verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good. All things is referring to the previous verses. The previous verses is talking about groaning. Well, groan, when it talks about groaning in the previous verses, groan is the word stenazo. It means to crowd through a narrow opening. In fact, it comes from the word, this is the verb, and the noun form of stenazo is stenos. And that is the word over there in Matthew 13 and 7. Straight is the gate. It's the word straight. So the straight gate is what causes us to groan. And all these things that we're going through when we go through the straight gate Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few find the narrow way. Few. There's not many people that's interested in this message. Did you know that? Some people will come to church and say, Jim's boring. You keep saying the same thing over and over. You're not getting it, are you? If you think, I mean, we, went, we on, on Wednesday night, we're going through the Bible. We took three years to go through the book of Genesis. We hit every character in it. We're at the end of Exodus. Then we're going to go through Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And then we're going to go through the books of the Kings. And we're going to hit every character in it. Now, if you think that's repeating, it is. Because you can't get all this in one time around. Can you? No, you can't. So straight is the gate and narrow is the way. The narrow way is, the, is entered by the straight gate. When you enter into this gate, and it's straight, it's crowding through a narrow opening. It's kind of like going through a turnstile. We go in one-on-one -on -one just between us and God, no one else. It's between you and God. And then when he puts you in through the straight gate... The way is narrow. Now, the narrow way has to do with stenazo because that's what causes us to groan. Groan doesn't mean, oh, I'm groaning, oh. When we groan, we get together and say, I talked to my mother and she just don't want this. Makes me sad. My brothers and sisters hate this message. They don't like the idea that I don't celebrate Christmas anymore because it's pagan. 
And we groan with one another and we get together and we fellowship and we groan. And it hurts. And it's supposed to hurt. Isn't it? And everybody can't hear this message. The Bible says in Proverbs 20 and 12, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. If you can hear the truth and you can see truth, that hearing ear God made. Hear the hearing ear. And that word here is the word shama in the Hebrew. It's also the word obey. If you hear, you obey. What you believe is what you do, and what you do is what you believe, isn't it? Faith cometh by hearing. That is believe. And here is the word akuo in the, in the Greek. And obey is the word hoop, A-K-O-U-O. And obey means to hear under or be subordinate to. So if you really are a believer, you're going to be hungry for the Word somewhere along the way. I'm not hungry to listen to Charles Stanley. He bores me out of my mind. I'm not hungry to talk to one of these mushy preachers on TV. Ed Young at Second Baptist Church in Houston. I was watching him before I come to church this morning. I thought, this guy is so boring. He has nothing to say. Talked to a lady, that same lady yesterday, and she said the churches are not saying anything anymore. And they're not. So if you can hear, you're a son. He's given you ears. He's placed you into the kingdom. And we, having predestinated us unto adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, and it is according to the good pleasure of his will. Now there's, the, there's one of the problems with people. He's predestinated us to be adopted according to the good pleasure. And God says, you want to ask me why I love one person and I don't the other? I love Jacob and hated Esau before they were, we were born. Here's why. It's according to the good pleasure of my will and don't ask me anything else about it. I do it because I want to. I'm God don't instruct me. You know the mind of the Lord that you can instruct Him? No, you don't. Now, so when we look back at the previous verses, the groaning has to do with the straight gate, the narrow way, and these are the things that work together for good. Narrow is the word thalibo. It comes from the base word thalipsis. Thalipsis is the common word tribulation from one end of the New Testament to the other in the Greek text. So the narrow way through the straight gate is full of tribulation and that's all this groaning that we're doing and all these things, no matter what it is, what you're going through, but it makes me mad. People make me mad and I get grumpy and I get to groaning. I noticed something I haven't told you about predestination. For whom he did foreknow, after Romans 8, 29, for whom, masculine gender, pronoun. The whom's is referring back to these that love God, back to the called. The called is the ecclesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, is the word church. It comes from kaleo and ek. Kaleo means to call out. We've been called out of this world to live righteously. That's what predestination is about. So we love God because He put His agape in our hearts. He's written His law upon fleshy tables of our hearts. And you know, the more I teach this, the more I understand it. It just kind of hit me while I was saying that. If you think you already understand it, you understand more than I do. Now, let me just quote this verse 29 this way. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, pro horizo, pro before, horizo is our word horizon, to predetermine for the light. The people he foreknew, he's predestined 
to be conformed to the image, image, icon is the word image, the likeness of His Son, Jesus. If you feel good that day. If someone hasn't made you mad that day. If you have a day at the beach, you're going to be like Jesus. If you have ice cream and cake, I'm going to be like Jesus. If I'm not upset at someone and everything is going smooth, I'm going to be like Jesus. Anybody can be like Jesus on a good day. That's what I haven't told you. Anybody can be like Jesus on any given day. Even the worst guy in the world, when he's having a real good day and he's not mad at anybody, and he's not out robbing banks and killing anybody that day, he can be like Jesus. We're talking about the time has to come in your life through enough trial and enough persecution that you throw your hands in the air and say, I surrender, I give up. What you're going to do is give up in your mind and stop the fight with the world. All of this is for your good. It's not whether you're having a good day or not. We should be like Christ 24 hours a day. 365 days a year. Jim, I just can't get there. I understand that. Is that an excuse for acting up and feeling bad and giving somebody a hard time? Well, yeah, but you know how they treated me. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they are behind on their house notes. Maybe they're worried. Maybe their mother's got cancer. Maybe she's dying. Maybe any number of a thousand things. Have you ever thought of that? What was Jesus like? Did he say, I'll be gentle and kind and compassionate and meek to these people if they'll treat me right? What did he do with, the, with Pilate? Pilate said, why don't you talk to me? Don't you know I've got power to release you? And Jesus, as the lamb does slaughters the sheep before his shears is dumb, he opened not his mouth. He was, he was going through the narrow way. He was paying for his wife. Why is he going to complain for the cross that he's going to have to bear to die for his wife? And why are we going to complain about the daily cross that we have to bear if you're going to come after Christ? You're going to have to take your cross and die daily in Luke 14, 27, aren't you? Without it, but when somebody's putting you on a cross, it doesn't feel good, does it? And why are they going to put you on a cross? Because you're speaking truth to them. When you speak truth, you don't speak truth in anger. If some of you would just follow me out in public, I'd just talk to people. I mean, I say, I tell waitresses, hey, here's a DVD and... And you may hear some things on this that you don't like. Well, like what? Well, maybe I, I, I don't believe in Christmas. I believe it's paganism. Don't believe in Easter. Don't believe that God loves everybody. And I accept whatever answer they give me. And if they give me something, I become very rational with them. Well, I think God loves everybody. I said, well, most people feel that way. I don't say, well, God doesn't. I say, most people think that God loves everybody. But the Bible says... God loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born. The Bible says that God hates all workers of iniquity. Then I let them comment to me. I just talk with them. You're not looking for goats to turn into sheep. You're only looking for sheep. And if they're sheep, they've been sheep from the foundation of the world, haven't they? Why argue with people and why get upset at anyone He's predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus daily around the clock. Now, you say, Jim, that's easy for you. Well, you're right. I've been a believer for about 68, 69 years since I was four, five, six years old, something like that. And I've gone to hell and back. I mean, I've gone through fire and trials. I've nearly died several times. I've been in car wrecks. I've been a singer out there in nightclubs from one end of this nation to the other. I preach in churches from one end of this nation to the other. God has just ground me into the ground, put me through every kind of trial and tribulation till I begin to bow to Him. He's broken me. You know what He's done? He's made me meek. Pros, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek means to be tame, 
I was a wild bucking bronc as a young baby believer. I was just like a bronc that he had to ride into the ground. And he did that with trials and tribulations. And God has made me groan. He has made me groan so many, so long and so hard. I mean, I can tell my life story and it's like a panoramic movie. I've been so many places and done so many things. I've sung with stars. I've been on stage across America. And it was all worth nothing. And I'll tell Mary, I'll say, I just regret I was ever in the music business. She says, but if you hadn't have been there, you wouldn't be who you are and where you are now. I say, you're right. I regret it. That's called repentance. And God says, I worked it for good. Well, it reminds me of something over here. In the last chapter of Genesis, let's go over and look at that. Last chapter of Genesis. Whenever you're ready to complain, that's not like Christ. I'll be like Jesus about eight hours a day, but I have a right. I'm going to take a break for other, other eight hours, and I'm going to sleep another eight hours. In eight hours, I get to be grappy and mean. And if, I, if it's on my eight hours to be like Jesus, no, this is not a part-time job. Is it? It's not what it is. People think, you sure are mean and ornery. I am hard on sin because I've been in so much of it. Nobody here has been somewhere that I haven't been. I'll guarantee you. Nobody. Uh, when you've been on stage, Dwayne knows this. Boy, the, the world is at your feet. And you get involved in insanity. Sin. It's not worth it. Look here. This, this is what this reminds me of, what we're talking about here. Joseph is in Egypt. He's been sold into Egypt by his brothers. He's been lied about. He has been talked about, gossiped about. There is not a man in the Old Testament that we can find that was as righteous as Joseph. Joseph was the eleventh son of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob loved Joseph more than all of his sons. He really loved Joseph. Joseph is the picture of Jesus. Joseph in the 37th chapter of Genesis, the 37th chapter of Genesis, he sold into Egypt by his brothers. He had those dreams his brothers resented. And they got mad at him. They got furious at him. They took Joseph and, and they were going to take him and kill him. And Reuben, his older brother of all people, said, don't kill him. Let's pretend that he's dead. And we'll, we'll, take a, we'll kill a lamb and put the blood on his coat and take it to our father and say, Joseph is dead. But we'll sell him to a caravan going to Egypt. And they sold him. They sold it, their brother, sold him out because Jacob favored him and he'd made Joseph. Jacob made Joseph the inheritor of everything. When he gave him the coat of colors, it wasn't a coat of colors. That's not the word in the Hebrew. It's the word pos. It means a coat of lengths. When his brothers saw him coming there into northern Israel, they saw him wearing the coat of lynx. That was the coat of inheritance. He said, our father has given our little baby brother this coat to inherit all of the, all of the family's fortunes. They said, let's kill him. Well, he goes to Egypt. And you find him over there in the 39th chapter of Genesis, he's in the house of Potiphar. And Potiphar was the head, was one of the head of Pharaoh's guards. Potiphar was high up in Pharaoh's house. And Potiphar, Potiphar loved Joseph. He trusted Joseph. But Potiphar, being a real high man in the kingdom, he probably had any woman he wanted. And he had a wife, no doubt, that was beautiful. 
because she tries to seduce Joseph. And when she tries to seduce Joseph, that's Potiphar's wife. Well, she gets Joseph in her, in her little lair, in her bedroom, whatever it is, and she starts making passes at Joseph. He says, I cannot do this and sin against God. So one day she grabs hold of him and holds on to his coat and he leaves it behind and runs. He is fleeing this lust. Now, Joseph was very fair to look upon. He was a very good-looking guy. She wouldn't have made a pass at him if she didn't think she had a chance. She must have been beautiful. So she makes a pass at him. He says, no. And he says, no, one too many times. And she begins to holler for the guards. Come, come quickly. Joseph has tried to seduce me. Well, under, under the Egyptian laws, the penalty for that seduction would have been death. But Potiphar knew his wife. <laughs> he knew her. So instead of killing Joseph, he puts him over in prison. And when he's in prison, he's in prison. And he meets the Pharaoh's baker and the Pharaoh's butler. Now for some reason, they are in prison something they've done or something that Pharaoh has thought they had done and they come to Joseph and they hear that he can interpret dreams and the butler comes to Joseph first says he has this dream and Joseph tells him well this dream is about in three days you're going to be lifted up out of prison and replaced to your former position former position And then the baker hears about this, and he says, I had a dream too. Perhaps you can interpret my dream. And Joseph interprets his dream, and he says, these are three days. In three days, you're going to be taken out of prison and hung by the neck until you are dead. Now, that's not exactly what he wanted to hear. But that's exactly what happened. He was hung. Well, the butler, as the butler's leaving prison, Joseph tells the butler, don't forget me. And the butler forgot him. Let me put that on the board. The butler forgot Joseph. So he forgets Joseph. Joseph is still in prison. And the butler's out of prison. And the Pharaoh has two dreams. And the Pharaoh has these dreams and he calls in all of his Chaldeans. Chaldeans are Eastern magicians and soothsayers that are supposed to be able to interpret dreams. And none of them can. And then all of a sudden, the butler remembers Joseph. Butler remembers Joseph. Now, is Joseph being done right as far as man is concerned in all of this? No, he's a righteous man. Everything, all of this groaning he's going through, and his father has been told he's dead, some wild animal killed him. Jacob, his father, is mourning and weeping, and it's like his brothers don't even care about Jacob's mourning and weeping. Well, the Pharaoh has these two dreams. One is about these real lean flesh cattle going down into a uh, these fat flesh cattle going down into a river. And when they come up on the other side, they are lean fleshed and they're emaciated. And he has this other dream about this good corn and then this a field of this bad corn and. The Chaldeans are the magicians of Pharaoh cannot interpret the dream. 
And the butler remembers Joseph. He says, Pharaoh, I... Now, the butler was the closest man to the Pharaoh. He wasn't a butler like, like, like what we think. We think of a butler. He was a cupbearer. That's what the butler was. He was the man that took the cup to the Pharaoh and said, here is your wine or here is your grape juice. And the Pharaoh would say, you have to taste it first. In case I've got some enemies trying to kill me, if you die, then I won't drink it. But if you live, then I will drink it. So the butler or the cupbearer was the closest man to Pharaoh. He served him day and night. So the butler, the cupbearer, was close to Pharaoh. He said, there's a man in prison that has the gift of dreams. He can perhaps interpret this dream, and he brings Joseph in front of Pharaoh. And he says, can you interpret this dream? He said, I can interpret nothing. God interprets dreams. And he tells his people, don't tell him anything about these dreams. Joseph stands before him, brings up the dreams, interprets the dreams to Pharaoh, and says there will be seven, these seven lean cattle, these seven fat cattle will be seven good years, plenty, years of plenty. These seven good stalks of corn will be seven good years. They're the same dream. And the, the bad stalks of corn, that's seven lean years. These lean cattle coming out of the river, That'll be seven years of famine. The Pharaoh says, what can we do about it? He says, well, you can put a man in charge of the grain throughout the land and put up the grain for seven years and you'll have plenty to get through the lean years. And Pharaoh said, what better man could I have to put in charge than Joseph? And Joseph becomes second in command in Egypt. He becomes second in command. But the famine is all through the land of Egypt. It is not only in Egypt. It's all over the land of Israel. And Jacob's got 11 brothers over there and his father over here. And there's plenty in Egypt after the seven years are up. Well, during the famine years, they're over here in Egypt. Joseph, Joseph's brothers his 11 brothers and his father. And his father's over here and he's telling his brothers, if we don't get grain, we hear there's a, a prince in Egypt that has food. That's the one that they all hated, but they don't know it's Joseph. And, they, and Jacob sends his sons over there to get grain. But Joseph doesn't reveal himself. He speaks to them through an interpreter and they're buying to this new king in Egypt, second in command to Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, you have every charge of everything in Egypt except my household and my wife. But everything belongs to you. Was this good? I guess it was. Was it working together for good? Joseph's story really touches me. So they come to Joseph, and Joseph says, they bring money, and then when he sees them, he doesn't reveal himself. He says, do you have any other brothers? Ten of them come there, and Jacob would not let his youngest son, Benjamin, go. Benjamin was the only son he left had left of his beloved Rachel. He said, I love Rachel so much, and I can't let Benjamin go. I can't lose him. I've already lost Joseph, my beloved Rachel's son. So when the ten sons come over there, everyone except Benjamin, Joseph says, do you have any other brothers? He knows they do. He just wants to know if Benjamin is alive and well. Yes, we have one brother. His name is Benjamin back there. And we had one other brother, and he is not. They're talking to the man that they're saying he's dead. See, he's dead. But it's Joseph standing in front of him. He doesn't reveal himself. He says, all right, you go back. You take this 
grain back to your father, but one of you has to stay with me. And he takes Simeon. You stay here. And they're having a fit. Simeon has to stay there. So they go back home. They're still in the years of famine. And they eat up all the grain. Jacob says, you have to go back. They say, this prince says, we can't come back unless we bring Benjamin. And Jacob says, no, not my beloved baby Benjamin. You can't have him. They said, we must go or we will die of starvation. This is a picture of Christ who is, has the spiritual food that we need when we go to him. They go back, they take Benjamin with him. And you know the story. Joseph had hidden their money in their bag when they went home. And they said, we brought this money back to you. And the Pharaoh says, we don't know anything about money. So he tricks them again. Joseph wants to make sure that his brothers are repentant of what they had done to him. So they, he says, you can go back to your father, but you have to to leave this Benjamin with us. They said, no, we'll die first. Our father will die without Benjamin. We can't leave him here. And Joseph is so torn. He doesn't know what to do, so he's going to reveal himself to his brothers. And I want us to back up to the 46th chapter. What? The 45th chapter. So here's where we are. We're still talking about predestination. All of these things working together for good. Joseph brings his brothers all around him. He hasn't told them who he is yet. Verse 1, chapter 45. And Joseph could not refrain himself before his brothers that stood by him. And he cried to the guards, Cause every man to go out from me. And they're saying, You can't stay here with these men. He says, Go out from me with these men. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he began to weep aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard him weeping, standing in the room with his eleven brothers. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. He was weeping when he said that, I am Joseph. Doth my father live? Is my father still alive? And they can't even hear the end of that sentence. And his brethren were standing there aghast. They could not answer him. They could not open their mouths. They're going, ah, Joseph! Was this all wrong that they did to Joseph? Did they lie about him? Did Potiphar's life, wife lie about him? Yeah. Was it for the good of Israel? Yeah. And when you go through, people lie about you. Blessed are ye when men shall persecute you. When they say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake rejoice and leave for joy. Great is your reward in heaven. Are you supposed to be thankful when people do bad things to you? That's the hard part of conforming to the likeness of Christ. I said it, anybody, give, somebody give you a new car, you can be thankful for that. Somebody pay you bills, you can be thankful for that. Give you ice cream cake and day at the beach, you say, well, I know this is working together for good. I have never seen anybody, even uh, Thomas Watson says in his book, All Things for Good, no one ever bowed to the will of God through a good day, through having a good time. You have to go through the hard times. You have to go through all that groaning for things to work together for good because it's what changes us, isn't it? Hard times change us. Good times does nothing to us. 
but make us lazy, doesn't he? So Joseph is revealing himself to his brothers. His brothers could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. <laughs> I guess so. Man, boy, that is nearly comical. They were troubled at his presence. They were terrified that they were standing there in front of Joseph, who was, had Pharaoh's ring upon his finger. He was the official authority of Egypt. And they sold him and lied about him. But look what he says. If we can learn to be this way, it's all working together for our good. Joseph said unto his brethren, come near, come near to me. Come here. He's very mature. When somebody's having a hard time, just say, come near to me. Put your arms around them, if they're a believer. I pray thee, and come near, and I... And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. You lied about me, lied to our father. Put me in the house of Potiphar. He, his wife lied about me. I ended up in prison. Then I got out of prison, became second in charge of all of Egypt. And therefore, be not, ang be not grieved nor angry with yourselves. Uh, next time somebody does something bad to you, can you say, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. How in the world could God do the sending if it was their evil thoughts and their jealousy and envy that sold him to Egypt? God manipulated their thoughts and their minds to do what they did that day. Do you think God's not manipulating people in your life? If we can learn to be like Joseph, that's the likeness of Jesus, isn't it? The likeness of Christ doesn't come with an easy time. It comes through the straight and the narrow way. All these things work together for good. Not on a good day, but on every day. Jim, I just can't get rid of myself. Then you go stick your hole in the ground somewhere when you're having a bad time and you can't be like Christ don't don't exhibit that self person to a world when you're in bad shape until you can learn to overcome that now look here what Joseph says be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither for God is the one that sent me before you with your evil thoughts God even had to enter the life in the heart God had to cause Potiphar to pick out a sleazy woman to get her over into his house so that she would try to seduce Joseph and then lie about Joseph. And that's going to work together for good, isn't it? Without Joseph, his family is going to starve. He has to be in Egypt, doesn't he? Therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves. God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land. They're only into the famine two years. They've got five more years of famine to go. They've had the good years, and Joseph has put up all these grains in the land. That's why their brother, the word went out through all the land that there was this great prince in Egypt that had grain to spare and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest there's not going to be any crops for another five years and God sent me before you with your evil thoughts and your evil deeds and your anger and your rage and your fury to preserve you a posterity the posterity is their children and their children's children in the earth and to save your lives with a great deliverance. Look at verse 8. So now it was not you that sent me here. <laughs> Don't try to make sense of the actions of God. They're the ones that lied about him and got him in Egypt, wasn't they? But God said it wasn't you. Joseph said it wasn't you. It was God that put it into your minds to sell me. So when somebody's doing evil to you, it's working together for your good, isn't it? 
Because God's got in charge of our whole lives and He's not going to leave us nor forsake us ever. And everything that we go through, the bad particularly, let me just emphasize that, the bad things you go through work together for good because you belong to God. You say, I hadn't seen it yet. Well, wait about 15 or 20 years, okay? I, what I went through in the mid-60s and the early 70s, I thought my life was destroyed. And I could go through lots of stories. I thought I will die before this is over. I can't live through this. But I did. And you know what that's like now? It's like somebody pouring water on the ground. All those events, now I can see they made me who I am today. What you're going through is going to make you into the likeness of Christ. That's what you're predestined to. Let's finish reading this. Now, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. If God did the sending Joseph there, then he had to manipulate the minds of these evil men to do their evil deeds, and it was for the good of Israel, wasn't it? But God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh. He's put me in charge of Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh trusts me with everything. And Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout the whole land of Egypt. I am the ruler of Egypt. And I'm Joseph, the eleventh son of Jacob. Now, then he goes through all of this of sending, of calling for his father and all of them to come over to Egypt. And Joseph sends for Jacob. And Jacob has 70 souls to come with him. Jacob, Joseph sends for his father Jacob whose name is changed to Israel. And he sends for him with all of his household for his 11 brothers and they all come to Egypt. And they're going to be in Egypt 400 years, aren't they? And they go to Egypt 400 years and when they're there, it is without all this happening, there wouldn't be a Moses to lead them out of Egypt, would there? Without all this happening, Moses wouldn't get the law on Mount Sinai starting in that 20th chapter of Exodus, would he? They wouldn't be in Egypt if Joseph hadn't been sold into Egypt. Moses wouldn't have led them out of Egypt and brought them to the promised land. There would be no Moses. There would be no law without Joseph being sold into Egypt. Would there? Well, over here in the 50th chapter... Jacob dies at the end of the 49th chapter. He gathers all of his sons around him and gives them their blessings and their cursings. They, they, they didn't all get blessings. Some of them received a curse, like Simeon, like Reuben. And then he gives the blessings to Levi, to be the priesthood, to Joseph and his family to be the inheritance through his second-born son Ephraim, and to Judah, who will be the king of Israel. Out of Judah would come the king. These are sons. But when, but when Jacob dies, they're all sitting around going, Oh, Joseph is in charge, and he's our little brother, but he's the prince of Egypt. Now, now that dad is dead, Joseph will probably kill us. He could have killed him already if he'd have wanted to. So they come to Joseph, and they... And look at verse 15 of chapter 50. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, talking about Jacob, Jacob had died. Jacob was Israel. The twelve sons become the nation. They saw that Jacob was dead. They said, Joseph perhaps will hate us now. He only kept us alive for the sake of our father. That shows you how shallow his eleven brothers were. That's why God gave the kingdom to Joseph. Joseph had the inheritance. And will certainly require us all the evil which we did unto him. He's going to pay us back. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying, Thy father Jacob did command before he died saying. Now here they're going to lie. Here's what our father Jacob told you to do, Joseph. They're terrified of Joseph because he is the king's second in command. So shall you, 
they sent a messenger to Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph. Now here's what they're saying that Jacob said, and Jacob didn't say any such thing, because Jacob knew his son Joseph. He knew he was a righteous man. So the, the eleven brothers, they say, Tell Joseph this. Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. Forgive them. For they did unto thee evil, but it was for Israel's good, wasn't it? And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph starts weeping and saying, Don't you understand? I love you. I am not angry with you. I am not going to hurt you. And he wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before Joseph's face. They were scared of him. And they said, Behold, we are thy servants. That was one of Joseph's dreams. When their sheaves came and bowed down to his sheaf there in the 37th chapter of Genesis. That's one of the reasons they sold him because of what they're doing right here. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, am I in the place of God? Am I going to place myself in God's place? But as for you... You thought evil against me when you did it all. The word thought is the word kashab. C-H-A-S-H-A-B. C-H-A-S-H-A-B. It means to fabricate. Now fabricate comes from the word fabric. A fabric... It's a weaving together of threads to make a beautiful tapestry. You wove these things together for evil. But watch what he says. But God meant it unto good. That word meant is the same word, kashab. You're weaving your evil thoughts. You're doing your evil deeds. It comes together in a fabric and was my plan and program for this to come together. Why am I going to kill you? This is all the will of God. God sent me before you to preserve the life of Israel, my people. So when you're going through hard times in life and somebody's doing you wrong... If you can wait and not lose your temper and not go berserk on them, if they beat you out of money or they steal your car or they do something real bad to you, say, this is all going to work together for my good. Not my good on a good day. My good on every day. The only thing that makes things work together for good is trials and tribulation and persecution. David said much about this. David made the statement. He said, when I was afflicted, then I loved your word and your commandments. God has to afflict us with trials and tribulation in the narrow way, not for a good day. You're not predestined to conform to God when you feel like it. Everyone was not predestined. When he says, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. There in verse 30, Romans Eight. And then he called them, he also justified. When you get to that word justified, everyone that was predestined was called, justified, and glorified. And call, predestined, called, justified, and glorified in Romans 8 and 30. These are all, every one of these, are what's called aorist indicative verbs. You say, I don't know what that means. Let me make it real simple. They're past tense verbs. That means 
before the foundation of the world, those that were predestined were called by God. Ecclesia, called out, is the word church. We were called out by God. We were justified. This word justified really proves that everyone predestined was not. Everyone was not predestined. Justified means to declare innocent. Do you think everybody in the world was declared innocent? No. Everybody was not justified. Only the few going through the narrow way. Those were the ones that were called justified and glorified before the foundation of the world. If this all happened before the foundation of the world, then God has to put all this plan, this program has to, he put it all in a computer program before the foundation of the world and hit enter. That's what he did, didn't he? Everything that's going on in your life is for your good as a believer. What about when I get off in sin? God needs to beat you severely to cause you to learn not to do that, doesn't he? He has to scourge every son he receives. <coughs> the scourge is necessary to partake of his holiness. And that is the likeness of Jesus. Hagiosmos, H-A-G-I-A-S-M-O-S is the word holiness. He scourges every son he received that we might be partaker of his holiness. Holiness comes from hagios, which is the word holy. And holy means pure, single. If you're ever going to become one as a person, you start off as two people. You start off as an inner man and an outer man. When you're born again, you have a whole lot of outer man. You got self. The outer man serves the law of the flesh. The inner man is Christ in you. And the outer man wants self. It wants contention. It wants strife. It wants to argue. It wants to have one's way. I, you can't treat me that way. Well, if somebody's treating you that way until you learn to take it, you're not like Christ. Jim, should I just allow people to beat me? Well, if somebody beats you, what good does it do to start arguing with them? They've already got your money. Huh? Can you get it back? When somebody steals from you, when somebody hurts you, can you undo it? You know what you can do? Get away from them. Withdraw from every brother that walks disorderly. The opposite of... You have... Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rebuke them. And if these works of darkness will not... Works of darkness... And darkness doesn't just mean drug dealers. It's somebody who doesn't believe and practice the truth. To get a, What you do is when they won't repent, no repentance, what you do, you don't get mad at them, you separate from them. You separate. Even if a man is a brother, the Bible says if he will not walk according to the Word of God, separate from him. If you walk according to the Word of God, you walk in agape, don't you? That's walking in God's commandments. And when you do that, you don't just do that on a good day. You do that every day, all day. Jim, I'm not there yet. I know that. Work on it. Pray, Lord, help me to accept what comes along. I believe the doctrine of predestination is what really helps people learn. I have learned to accept. I have people here, several of you have been mad at me at times. I'm not mad at you. I'm just trying to help you. I've said some real pointed things to everybody here, most people here. Say so you can't do that. And it's going to take trials and tribulations to bring you to a point where you say, I want to be like Jesus, I'm so tired. You know what being like Jesus makes you? It makes you a child again. You have to become childlike. That's what Jesus said, except you become as little children. You cannot enter the kingdom. You have to be in, when it comes to in animosity and in envy 
be a child. Children, the Lord said, be a child in that because they forgive really easily, quickly, and they get back together. Be mature in the Word, in agape. Now, we're talking about, he says, God meant it for good. Let me read verse 21. Well, let me finish reading 20. And as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it to good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save Israel alive. It says save much people, but the reason the twelve sons of Jacob are alive is because you sold me into Egypt. I have to be here to, so that the family can be saved. You had to lie about me. You had to cheat on me. You had to tell my father I was dead. You had to break his heart. You had to break my heart. Because it was necessary that I be in Egypt. Everything that you go through is necessary to make you who you're going to be. Now, people say, I just don't like that or I don't understand that. We've been talking about walking let me give you something here. If you're going to be like Jesus, that's not on a good day. That's on every day. That's all day long. Do I feel good every day? I don't feel good every day. But when I get to feeling bad, I've learned to put a rein on myself, to bridle my tongue, to kick myself right in the tail and say, don't jump at these people. Don't jump at your wife. Don't snap at people. You feel bad, but don't do that, Jim Brown. Go kick yourself. You ever had to learn to make yourself do that because you felt bad? Things are going bad in your life. Well, those are working to get... You know what God's doing? He's going to put you through enough of that till you give up and you surrender fighting other people. When you fight, it starts in the mind. He's going to have to change your mind to constant, continual, daily repentance. He had to do it to me. I was well past 60 before I really got to believing this message that I preached totally. Do I think I'm going to learn some more? Yes, I do. If you think you've learned it all, you haven't. You have to understand every persecution that you go through, every trial you go through is for your good. If you're a believer. It's, if you're not a believer, it's not worth anything. It's just going to get you in hell. God... God does, not, God does not put everybody through trials to get them to believe. He puts some men through trials that he's ordained for destruction. They're having a hard time on earth, and they're going to have a hard time in hell in eternity. I told that to some inmates out at Riverbend when I was teaching out there years ago. I said, if God puts you in this room, we were in a lockdown area. I said, if he puts you in here and you can hear this, I said, God put you in prison to, so you can hear the truth. But I said, if you can't hear and you're mad at the authorities and you're mad at the ward and you're mad at the guards and you're mad at life and you're mad at me, God's giving you a hard time here and he's going to give you a hard time in hell. And that's the truth. Now, if, if agape is walking in God's commandments, isn't that the likeness of Jesus? It's the likeness of Jesus around the clock. If you'll get old enough and live long enough and go through enough trials, you'll get tired of fighting. I'm tired of fighting. I won't fight anybody. People think when I preach real hard that I'm mad at the world. I'm angry at false teachers, but I'm not mad at the sheep ever. I'm not mad at anybody here. I'm just trying to help you learn what I've learned. It's, be it's easier to teach somebody what you've learned than what you haven't learned. I don't think young men can preach this message. I don't think a young man can really get a hold of what I'm saying because you have to go through it to understand it. God has turned me from a fighting, just mad at the world all day long through my 30s and in my 40s, just wanting to get angry at people and I just want to punch him out to bring me to a quiet way of living. Me and Mary live a real quiet life. And we got emails coming in. Jim Brown's got all these sins in his life. And Jim Brown's this. And he don't know what he's talking about. I just go, okay. That's all I got to say to you. I'm not going to defend myself. Jesus didn't defend himself, did he? You know where defense of self starts? 
It starts in your mind. Then it comes out your mouth. Then it comes out your fist. It starts up here. If you're going to be like Christ, God has to change your mind. That's called repenting, isn't it? Metanoia. To be changed and think differently. So we're in a process of fire and trials and tribulation to bring us to a place of the likeness of Christ, aren't we? Likeness. And we've said that that likeness walks in God's commandments. Well, God's commandments are being meek, poor in spirit, compassionate, sympathetic. All this is to the believers. When you learn to do this, when somebody's losing it in front of you, you want to reach out like Jesus did and say, come here, let me hug you. Have you ever learned that with your kids when they're, oh, I hate you, Mommy. I hate you, Daddy. What do you do? I say, I hate you too. Is that what you do? <laughs> you can say, come here, Mommy loves you, but you can't act up like that. We have to learn that this thing is working together to for good every day. You say, I'm still going through it, and I don't understand that yet. We'll just wait, and you'll learn to understand it as a believer. Do I have any time, Mike? Huh? Well, you got... predestination's true and God does not love everybody John 3.16 doesn't say that neither does 2 Peter 3.9 God only loves his wife the church he died for her and that's all and his church will hear these, this message and his church will believe if you belong to him you will believe but when you start believing that's just the beginning of your journey He's going to take you through all kinds of affliction and trials, causing you to bow and to become like Christ. Did, what did you say, Mike? 22. 22. All right. I got some other things I want to tell you about predestination. We've said the likeness of Jesus. Like Jesus. That's what you're predestined to right there. To be like him every day, all day. Do I believe most people are going to accomplish that not before they get pretty old? After you get old enough and after you've gone through enough fire, you're going to surrender to the will of God and say, Lord, it's whatever you want. And if you want these people to beat me up every day, I've said it before. If Mike Tyson lived next door to me and every morning my doorbell rang and I opened the door and he hit me right in the mouth as hard as he could, and God says, that's my will. I'd get up every morning and answer that door. If God revealed to me, he wanted Mike to hit me in the mouth every day. You have to learn that the world's going to hit you in the mouth. When you preach predestination, you preach that Christmas is pagan, you preach that God does not love everybody, you preach these truths that men have to go through affliction and persecution and tribulation and men have to be hated by the world. God's people have to be hated by the world. That's not what this world is preaching out here in these pulpits. Is it? What we're preaching is, by preaching predestination, we're preaching whom God did foreknow. Foreknow. God has predetermined that you will have to go through every kind of tribulation and fire and trial to break you and to humble you and to make you meek and tame in order for you to be willing to be like Jesus. God has to make us willing because there is none good. None is good. Not one. None seeks after God. All men drink iniquity like water. How are you ever going to become like Jesus if God doesn't cause it through all of these persecution and lies like Joseph's brothers did to him? If God doesn't do that in your life, you're never going to get like Christ. If you get old enough, you'll understand what it's about. If you live long enough, you come to the place, you say, this fight and don't get it. I'm not going to fight anybody anymore. I believe it was Tecumseh who said, I shall fight no more again forever. That's the way I feel. I won't fight people. 
I will preach hard. I'll be passionate from the pulpit. When I get out of the pulpit, you want to fight, you have to go down the street. I'm not going to fight you. I witness to people real simple. I'll talk truth to them. When they start getting mad and raising their voice, I say, excuse me, I have somewhere else to go. I'm looking for the elect. That's it. Now, if, if we are like Jesus, we walk after God's commandments, don't we? We walk after His commandments. We're going to be compassionate. We're going to be meek. We're going to be poor in spirit. We're going to be tenderhearted. We're going to be gentle. And all this applies to the believer. While the believer is contrary and honorary, well, this is the way we're going to be. And the reason some believers are contrary and honorary and trying to offend you is because they haven't grown enough yet. You don't get mad at a little kid because they're not grown up, do you? Then why get angry with each other when you're not grown? Now, there's a, there's a word in the Bible. You have concepts in Scripture. If I can find another word that means to walk after the commandments of God, it would be a synonym for agape, wouldn't it? For agape, and that's the word love, to walk after His commandments. Love, Second John 6. Second John 6. Anywhere I can find another word that has to do with walking righteously in agape. Well, there's a word I want to show you in the Greek text. If you'll go over with me to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. I love Joseph's life. That's a picture of Christ. If we can learn to be like Joseph and just accept whatever comes with a gentle, sweet spirit, it may not feel good, but learn to force yourself not to react the way the flesh would react. Look here in Galatians 5. Galatians 5, and look here in verse 22. Now, this is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is in opposition to the works of the flesh that start in verse 19. In fact, let's read verse 18. If ye be led by the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit is truth, isn't it? Holy Spirit is truth. Well, the Bible says that in John 14, 15, 15, 26, 16, 13, and 1 John 5 and 6. The Bible says this is the Comforter, even the Spirit of Truth, and the Spirit is truth. So everywhere you find the Holy Spirit, it's truth. It's, the, it's God living in us that causes us to be able to understand truth. So everything that truth is would be the Holy Spirit in us. The Bible says, Thy Word is truth. And the Word of God is Jesus, isn't it? In the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made by the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is the Word, the Word is truth, and the truth is the Holy Spirit. Well, the truth is God's Word, isn't it? Isn't His Word His commandments? So if you walk in God's commandments, which is agape, then you walk in Christ, you walk in His Word, you walk in truth, and you walk in the Spirit of God. It's all the same. So he says, If you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Then he tells you about the works of the flesh, or these, which are manifest, adultery, fornication. And this is not just literal adultery, it's spiritual adultery. It's spiritual fornication as well. Uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. I could go through all these definitions of these words, but I don't have time right now. Hatred, 
variants, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God was a term for Israel. We're the spiritual Israel, the spiritual kingdom. You can't inherit the church and be, you can't be a son of God and do these things continually. But I used to do those things. Yes, such were some of you, but God has redeemed you and brought you out of it. But in opposition to the fruit of the, the works of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit is. Now, is is a form of the verb to be, and is is singular. And fruit is singular. So there's one fruit, and it comes out in many forms. The fruit of the Spirit is agape, love. Walking in God's commandments. If you have the fruit of the Spirit, you're going to walk in God's commandments. And over time, He's going to cause you to walk in His commandments all day long. Not just part-time. I'll be a Christian on one day and I'll be a heathen on the next. No, not the way it works. Christianity is not a part-time job. Joy. Kara. Joy. Our joy is in others. Paul told the Philippians, you are my joy. Peace, irene, to bring together into one. Long-suffering, putting up with things a long time, macrothemia. Gentleness. We're going to be gentle. It means easily approachable. Goodness. Faith. Meekness temperance against these there's no law this is not lawless and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh and continue to crucify the flesh now anytime you have an aorist indicative a past tense in the Greek it can be a, something that happens in the past that continues or it continues a certain point and stops or it can happen one time in the past you have the consumative, which would be that one time. You have the constant and continual uh, past tense, and you have one that doesn't have a particular time ending on it. These two are hard to differentiate between one another. So whenever, do we crucify the flesh once? No, we crucify the flesh daily by taking our cross daily, don't we? With the affections and the lust, if we live... In the Spirit, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. That word walk is the word stoichio. It would be a synonym for agape. Stoichio is agape walking in truth. Stoichio comes from stoichion. Stoichion, S-T-O-I-K-I-O-N. Stoichion actually means an orderly arrangement. Did God arrange all that order in the life of Joseph, did he arrange all that sin in the mind of his brothers? God's in charge of sin. You know that, don't you? He said, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. The only amount of evil the devil can do is the amount that God wants him to do, and that's it. The wrath of man will praise God, and the remainder of wrath will God restrain. That word wrath, there in Psalm 76.10, that word wrath is a word that means fury and rage. God says, man's fury and rage will praise me until I get to a part that won't praise me, and I cut it off right there. All the rage of man is praising God. It's bringing about the will of God in our lives. 
but you're not supposed to be a part of the rage. Let men rage against you. They raged against Jesus. And if we're in His likeness, we allow that to happen. We get away from them when it's necessary. And when we can't be around somebody because the reason you fight, you know why you fight? You hang around people that fight. It's real simple. You don't want to fight? Don't get around people that fight. Has anybody learned that besides me? I don't... The, I have, the Bible has much to say about withdrawing from people who walk disorderly, even if they're called a brother. Well, I, I won't even go around my kin folks. You know why? They don't want to hear what I'm saying, and it's going to end up in a fight. I won't go around my wife's kin folks. Not because I don't like them. Some of them are real easy to like. But I get in a fight with them. I just don't want to fight them, so I stay away from them. If I want to run around with somebody, I'll run around with Dave or I'll run around with one of y'all, Fred. I'd rather call them and say, hey, let's go eat. And, hey, let me go out here with one of these free will people that does Christmas and wants to fight with me. Why would I pick one of them over these guys? I wouldn't. I'm not going to. So we, we find here, it means an orderly arrangement. Even the word world in John 3.16, cosmos, means an orderly arrangement. God has an orderly arrangement of all things. That was an orderly arrangement of evil to bring about good in Joseph's life, wasn't it? And all the evil that goes on in your life is for your good. You got another word that means orderly arrangement, but does anybody remember what that is? Acts thirteen forty eight. Acts thirteen forty eight. Paul preached. He was on his first missionary journey. He left. Paul left Jerusalem. Went over here to Caesarea in Syria. Left. Went over here to a. Got on a boat. Went to Cyprus hit the coast of what we call Turkey. It was called Pamphylia back then. And went up here to Antioch in Galatia. Four cities in Galatia. Antioch that Paul was concerned with. Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. He went to all of those places. They stoned him and left him for dead at Lystra. But while he was at Antioch, he preached in the synagogue and he preached the resurrection of Christ in that 13th chapter and the Pharisees got furious with him and kicked him out of town. The Pharisees and the Jews didn't believe him. But the Gentiles began to believe. And here's what he says. In verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles. Jews, I'm not preaching to you anymore that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. That has a great meaning in it. It's the earth shall be full of his knowledge and glory, as waters that cover the sea. That is, the earth will be full of the church, the kingdom of God. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed, that's all. Only the ones ordained to eternal life, that word ordained is the word tasso. It means orderly arranged. God has arranged men to hear the truth at that time that were His predestinated elect family. And the only ones that believed that day were those that were ordained to eternal life. Those in the orderly arrangement, cosmos, John 3, 16, stoikion, or stoikio. That word stoikio means to march in military, to march in military file. To march in file, in rank. All the events of life are in a military rank, even including the evil, especially when the evil is 
arranged towards our lives. This has the same, is saying the same things when you go back here to Acts the second chapter. Look here at Acts the second chapter. In verse 47. They, all the apostles were there with the believing people, the 3,000 that believed that day. And they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There's a certain number that should be saved. And that's God's people. And God says, they will come to me. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And no man can come except my Father which has sent me. Draw him. Helco is the word draw. John 6, 44. Unless my Father drags him in. Because you don't have any will to come. God has to drag us in with the truth and with the Holy Spirit. And he pulls us in. And that's the truth. I know people don't like predestination. Do you know without predestination... There's no word of God. Because he has to birth who he wills. He births who he wants to. And we're born again by the will of God. He puts us in the fire. And the narrow way is the only way to heaven. And it's full of tribulation until you come in your life to a place of surrendering. Saying, Lord, you're not surrendering for eternal life. You're surrendering that outer man to do the will of God. That's what you're doing. And when you surrender to God, there comes a time in your life when you get really tired of yourself. Doesn't, doesn't they, old folks, don't you get tired of fighting, Gerald? Don't you just say, Lord? You, when you get old like us, like me and Gerald, you just say, that guy wants to fight. I think I'm going to go somewhere else. You know, well, I'll, I'll get in there and I'll give my opinion. And someone, everybody wants to give you a hard time, you just back away. Somebody says, you're a low-down, dirty sinner. So, yeah, that's what the Bible says. Yeah, it says we all drink iniquity like water. You're right. Find some place to agree with them and walk away. We're not supposed to be into ourselves and fighting the world. That's in our mind. That's where stress comes from. It comes from up here. When it comes out in your heart or in your asthma or in your ulcer, that's just the symptom of what's going on in your mind, that's all. Isn't it? I've run out of time and I've got a whole lot more to say on this. I hope you can understand. God has predestined us to conform to the Christ image daily and that's 24 hours a day. You say, Jim, I haven't accomplished that. I know that, but you will if you live in long enough. If you get tired enough of yourself. The problem with men, let me tell you, everybody here, your problem is you. That's all. My problem has been me. When you try to defend yourself and try to lift yourself up and say, I have my rights. God says, no, I have my rights. These people that are doing wrong, I'm going to put them in hell one day. You don't have to worry about vengeance. It belongs to me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, help us to conform to Christ's image every day. I know that some here haven't been through enough fire. Lord, give them more fire. That's what we all need to burn out this old man, this old self. This old man will kill us. If we live in this flesh long enough, we fret over stuff and things and our way and our rights. Lord, teach us that you're the one that has your rights. Thank you for truth, Lord. I pray for the flock that you'll mature them cause them to grow up and not worry about anything that people do just say my job is to get this message out and that's what I'm going to do regardless of the results lead us to your elect Lord we'll give you praise in Christ's name Amen one of these days we're going to get a hold of this Are you going to be around tomorrow? Yeah, I was going to, I forgot to bring your cards.
I was going to bring them today. I'll bring them tonight if you want to be. I'm going out to College Grove. Oh, are you? Okay. Thank you.